one, two, three. All right, guys. So for anybody listening out there, we've got a special update from Charles Hoskinson, uh, founder of IOHK and also leading the uh, Growth and Deek team, who's focusing on this new Scala client for ETC, as well as a whole bunch of other stuff for ETC. A lot of work's going on. So we've got a bunch of updates from Charles. Uh, Charles, take it away. Hey, Carlo. Thanks for having me on. Um, I swore I'd never be on Let's Talk ETC, but I felt, uh, why not? It was kind of a spur of the moment thing. Um, anyway, big long time listener, first first time on the show. Uh, Growth and Deek uh, it has been kind of moving along swimmingly. So I think it was about eight months or nine months ago when I was on Tizen's show, I uh, said, we'll be hiring a development team to go and build a client, um, which was kind of a crazy idea. And we originally said, eh, you know, we'll hire like three people or four people and they'll spend a few months and we'll kind of just get the ecosystem where it needs to go. Then when we actually got into the process of interviewing people, it was just brutal. We, we received a lot of resumes and we had to give everybody a technical test and there was a bit of an issue. And then we eventually came down to um, two teams, an Argentine team and a Polish team, and we couldn't choose between them. We were like, we like these guys so much. So I just threw in the towel and I said, ha, hell, we'll just hire everybody. So uh, the Growth Antique team is, is now at seven people. Uh, it's led by a wonderful Irish guy named Alan McSherry. Um, and uh, basically, they all came on board semi-full-time, full-time-ish around November, December. They kind of trickled in because we had to wait for them to finish other obligations and projects. And the whole team reached full strength about mid-January. So um, managing expectations, the, the first thing that we assigned them to do was just to understand the Ethereum protocol. So the people we had hired are all very solid computer science people. They have good backgrounds like master's degrees and they've been developers for quite some time. So you can give them documentation, you can give them white papers, you can give them pretty complicated tasks to do and they can do these things and do them well and securely. Um, but the challenge is that this team, uh, while they had experience with distributed systems, they didn't have experience in the cryptocurrency space. So the first challenge for us with uh, this team uh, was to just kind of bring them up to speed and introduce them to all of this exotic and new technology. And that's what they're currently working on. So I gave each of them a, a pretty dense set of white papers and reading materials and some courses, including the smart contract Udemy course and so forth, just to get their uh, feet wet. And they spent basically two months reading documentation, looking at code and, and walking their way through uh, this ecosystem. And they've learned uh, a huge amount in a very short period of time. Um, now that that is through, uh, they're about 50% of the way, 60% of the way through the Ethereum uh, protocol. Uh, and they've implemented as they go code and they've implemented about 15, 20% of the protocol in Scala. The goal will be to implement everything into Scala and uh, there's kind of like a pedagogical phase where it kind of works, but it's not a production client. And then the next stage will be to, to transform that effort into a secure production enterprise grade client written in 100% new code at Scala. So um, I'm very impressed with Alan's leadership. You know, I get daily reports. Uh, they're using U-Track, uh, Gantt charts and everything. So your standard scrum driven development is, is occurring. You know, the other thing is we just started live standups with uh, with the Growth Indie team. So on the 6th, we uh, broadcasted the first meeting and uh, every week thereafter, we intend on broadcasting a meeting. And uh, the roadmap, the Gantt charts, all these things will be made public uh, within the next few days or a week or two. It just depends on how long it takes our web devs to get it up and make it pretty and so forth. So uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to get on was just to kind of manage expectations. Because when you say you're building a client, um, that can mean many things. And uh, it's important what people should expect, when they should expect it, and uh, what the purpose of this client is. So let's discuss that. Um, so with respect to the pedagogical phase, that is nearly ended. Uh, and uh, this team, the Growth Indic team, has a, a pretty deep and detailed understanding of how cryptocurrencies work in general at this point, and a pretty detailed understanding of how Ethereum works. So um, now they're getting to the point where they're getting into the nitty gritty, like they're opening up the EVM, they're looking at each and every opcode, they're uh, trying to really understand this stuff at a level that only uh, people like Gavin Wood or uh, or people who've actually built a client would would understand it. Uh, this process will probably take another two months, in my estimation. Maybe a little faster, maybe a little longer. It depends on really uh, a litany of factors and you know the quality of documentation and other things. But so far, the documentation's been pretty good, and the code that they've read has been pretty good. Although we've noticed a few 
little issues between Geth and Parity, which were differences of opinion. But for the most part, the protocol is pretty well fleshed out. Uh, so exiting April, then the effort will be saying, okay, now let's take this pool of work and transform this pool of work into a beta, something that people can install, they can run on their computer, it'll connect to the test net, and it'll give us uh, basically all the functionality of Ethereum. Um, and then from that, the question is, how do we make it secure and enterprise grade? So how, how do we take it from something that works to something that works and you can trust with your money? Uh, that process will probably take another month to two months, depending upon how fast they can move and, you know, a litany of features, as well as how fast the security auditors and other people move. So we will put all the software that we write through security audit. We have a very good firm we work with for other projects called Grim. We may retain them for that, or we may use a different firm. Um, we've also been collaborating lightly with um, the guys at Rootstock. Two of our developers are co-located in the same workspace in Buenos Aires. So uh, we do have a chance to talk to Sergio Lerner and so forth. And they've, they've made certainly a lot of really good innovations on their side, like Decor. And they have some overlay protocols for speeding up smart contract computation. And they've also improved the EVM. They're getting like a five times speed up over um, the Ethereum J EVM because of some of the things that they've done. So our hope is to take some of those innovations and have them work their way into the growth and beat client as well. So it's kind of like managing expectations. Don't expect anything beta until June. Uh, and don't expect anything enterprise grade until maybe a few months thereafter, depending upon the review. But my hope is by the third quarter of this year that we will have uh, a completely independent code, 100% built from the ground up uh, Ethereum Classic client that is uh, in direct support of all the other clients, meaning you can talk to Parity, you can talk to Geth. Um, the other hope is that bundled with it, we'll have an IDE and all the tooling that people have built for Solidity, like Truffle and so forth. Um, probably pretty easy to do because we're going to use Electron as our wallet. We have a platform called Daedalus, which is built on top of uh, Electron, and we've already built a cryptocurrency wallet with it. And so we're uh, with the way we built Daedalus is it supports multiple currencies. So it'd be pretty simple for us to upgrade that front end uh, and then uh, make it support Ethereum Classic. Furthermore, um, Electron was built by GitHub for the Atom editor. So it's probably going to be pretty simple for us to get an IDE to work well with that. And so you can have a development environment uh, and also your wallet directly connected to each other. So that's uh, what's coming down the pipe for Growth and Deek. Nice, nice, good stuff. Uh, so yeah, that was a really good overall update on what's going on. And also, uh, I think you had something you wanted to mention about monetary policy as well. Yeah, so um, it's important to keep in perspective the difference between short-term and long-term. So currently the actually all of the major development work that's meaningful is being done by uh, Splix and, you know, the, the Geth client and the other core developers who are working on parity and so forth. So uh, they're responsible for the, the two hard forks that have occurred and they've done phenomenal work. And so what they've done is taken a code base that someone else wrote and they're keeping it on par with Ethereum and, and changing it where we, we deem necessary as a community. So um, it is unlikely that the growth and deep client will be operational prior to uh, the monetary policy being locked down. So it's likely that uh, MP will be set and implemented by the Geth and the Parity clients, uh, and uh, future features are going to have to come from uh, us three working together. So uh, this said, we have to really start getting the ball rolling on, on getting some basic principles down and, and getting a, a, an actual improvement proposal finalized so that we can get consensus around it and get it implemented. My hope would be to get it implemented sometime in March to April, if possible. Um, so uh, I think the community so far has been pretty gung-ho about sticking with proof of work. Uh, second, there's been a lot of discussion about what Ghost needs to do. And if we need to stay with Ghost, upgrade Ghost, replace Ghost, there's a, there's, there's a component there because Ghost does have a, a, a connection to the monetary policy. Um, the other thing is that uh, there has to be some discussion about basically uh, whether this is going to be the final monetary policy or if we intend on setting a date to tinker with it. Uh, for example, if we wanted to do something like install a treasury system. So uh, for our firm, we released a paper last year um, in Q4 on the Dash treasury system, and we didn't stop researching. We actually kept the thread, and we have another set of uh, documents and requirements and designs coming out uh, in the next week or two. And this is basically our philosophy of 
what a treasury system needs to look like. And we've been in discussions with um, a university in England to inculcate that project um, there and develop it over an arc of time, such as three to six months. So it is interesting if we're going to go with a final monetary policy in the next two months and say, that's it, never going to change. We're now like Bitcoin, it's set forever. Or we would do a monetary policy with a hook saying that we have to come back in a year and clean it up and finalize it with an understanding that we may add a treasury system or not. So our hope is to have something really meaningful out um, in the next week or so so that we can share it. And uh, our hope is to have a monetary policy event in uh, China sometime towards the end of the month. Um, and I think you've been trying to coordinate that. Do you have an update on it? Uh, yes, yeah, so there's a ETC a thon that's going on at the end of this month, uh, February 25th, 26th, and 27th, I believe. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll link to, we'll put a link for that in the description for everyone who wants to check that out. And since uh, you know we figured all the the key players and a lot of people that are very interested in this conversation will be all together for that ETC a thon, that would be a good time uh, since everyone's together to continue the discussion uh, beyond. ETC development and also talk about monetary policy. Right. Yeah. And uh, that, that's absolutely necessary. And it, it has to be done in China because uh, we've already done some events. Um, Avtar and others put on some great events over in Europe. Uh, but uh, China is one of the key drivers of our community. And so they need to be represented. I've always uh, believed that. So, um, yeah, monetary policy is kind of a tricky one. But I, I do agree that it, we really need to get the ball rolling and we, we have to get that stuff set. Uh, we won't be able to participate in it from an implementation standpoint because I don't think the growth in D client again is going to be available for that. It, there's a, too much of a lag on it. But I, I do have utmost confidence that once it's set, uh, it'll be pretty easy to push and implement in for uh, the Geth and the Parity client. Um, then, uh, you know, a slightly different topic, but interconnected is the overall roadmap and like where will the technology of Ethereum Classic go? Like what, what are we planning on doing? So I, I really believe in this philosophy called um, Shuhari, which is like a martial arts notion of like uh, learn, master, and then innovate. So uh, before anybody earns the right to go ahead and say, hey, let's take this existing system, which has had a tremendous amount of critical thinking and trial and error built into it, and let's throw it all away and build something new, they have to prove they know what they're talking about. And just being a founder of it doesn't uh, doesn't make me credible because I left the project pretty early on relative to its history. Uh, so uh, it was important to me that before, from IOH case side, we made any proposals at all about where we'd like to take the platform outside of uh, conversation pieces like these are things we could do, um, that we demonstrate that we have a mastery of the protocol that uh, is only equaled by people on the Ethereum Foundation side. So this is the kind of the first point of the Growth and Deek project is to say the proof is in the pudding. We've delivered a client. We understand Ethereum at a very elemental and deep level. We have shown our transparency by having weekly stand-ups, a public roadmap, uh, open code. Uh, and also when we go through the security audit and all these other things, these things will also be public. So people understand there's nothing up the sleeve. It's, you know, they, they see the intent. So after that's done, um, there will be some proposals that come from our side about for 20, late 2017 and 2018, what can we do with Ethereum Classic to differentiate it from Ethereum and make it a platform and a protocol in its own right that has a kind of perhaps different use cases or at the very least a different view of computation. Now, um, we've already started the research and the engagements. We actually have already started collecting uh, a lot of information from just going and talking to great people. Uh, I was in Shanghai recently at the Shanghai Winter School, and I had a chance to talk to a lot of different cryptographers about their research in Ethereum, everything from state channels to new consensus concepts. Um, we've had a lot of discussions about uh, basically what can we do to speed up validation or shard uh, the state space. Blockchain partitioning has been a really hot topic that we've been going over. So there's uh, a lot of really novel concepts. And actually, what's really cool is that while Ethereum Foundation has been really focused on proof of stake, and frankly, we have too. We, we have 10 people working on proof of stake every day. So uh, it is co cool and intoxicating. It turns out that there's a lot of innovation in the proof of stake, or the proof of work world. For example, there's uh, these proofs of sublinear complexity that Agalos has come up with, which are really neat. It seems a lot easier to implement a, a secure zero knowledge checkpointing system with a proof of work system than it would be with a proof of stake system. Um, we have a better notion of how to do side chains with proof of work than with proof of stake, although I think we can uh, eventually reach parity there. Um, so I think that 
there needs to be better PR for proof of work. Um, there needs to be certainly some acknowledgement of its downsides. I don't think it's the end all be all. Uh, Macaulay would be the first to tell people that five mining pools control all the hash power for Bitcoin. And so, you know, if you want five people control the state, uh, that's not so good. So there really does need to be some conversations about how we, we decentralize mining or make it more efficient, but it does seem to be a viable paradigm. And I do think it is something that is uh, compatible with smart contracts in general. But I think there needs to be a broader conversation. Like there's been some great work out of Cornell on trusted hardware, in particular using Intel SGX to do all kinds of things like smart contracts uh, that are private. Um, there's this concept called sealed glass proofs where you can prove you know something and sell it to a person. Uh, yeah. It's a really novel notion. Uh, you know, they also have uh, basically like Augur enabled by trusted hardware. It's called Town Crier. So we're just at the beginning of using these types of frameworks, but they're very well proliferated because every Intel chip has them now. And ARM has equivalent notions uh, with its, uh, with its uh, secure hardware zone. So uh, when you start talking about having every cell phone and every computer have these special modules, you have a very democratic distribution of, of hardware, and this can become a second layer to assist in removing some trust or to speeding up computation. So I, I do think there needs to be a, a, a more meaningful conversation about where trusted hardware's role is in uh, our technology and what we can do with it. But I am pretty excited about the notion of sticking with mining and perhaps doing something like BizCoin or Twin Chains, so maybe a two-stage protocol. Um, I am also really excited about the notion of innovating on the friending side. I, I think we would be very stupid as a community if we passed on the opportunity of trying for a treasury. Because that's like the ultimate repudiation of the whole notion of, of centralized funding to a foundation. You know, you say like, okay, well, one model is you have an ICO and you raise all this money. I've done it myself. It's a good model. But on the other hand, the problem with that model, and no one has you know, fully addressed this, is uh, dealing with the centralization of that money. You only have one decider. Um, and if that person's like, good and honest and fair and wise, maybe they make great decisions if they turn out to be like Donald Trump or something like that. Your, your whole ecosystem may go a little crazy for a little bit. So, uh, so it's important to say that the capital is decentralized, that there's some way that more than one actor can have access to that at some point. Um, mm -hmm. And the tech is there for this. It just needs to be properly packaged and vetted and assembled. And it's, uh, as a company, one of our priorities to do very rigorous research on it. So we're going to be presenting that, and our, our hope is we can get the Ethereum Classic community to, uh, to get behind it. The last point is about formal verification. Um, this is one of the most boutique and uh, exotic topics in, in development, um, and it's not commonly done by most developers. If you go to like a full stack web dev and you say, Where's your cock proof for this? They're going to probably look at you pretty weird because it's just not a common notion. Um, but it does occur in academia, especially in PLT when you're talking about functional programming. And it turns out that there's like 20 years of theory uh, that has really advanced things and made the tools a lot better and uh, sped things up a lot. But that theory hasn't worked its way into industry. Now, one of the things that IOHK as a company um, is extremely focused on is, is basically how are we going to build a pipeline where we can not only write good functional code and, and make that work well. It's amazing. We found a way to build a cryptocurrency in Haskell. That was not easy. And we we're almost there. And we're like, yay, great. But that's not good enough because Haskell's just Haskell. We want to do formal verification as well. It's because because we're like, it's like the spinal tap of cryptocurrencies. We have to take it up to 11. So uh, the formal verification component is, is really an interesting discussion. But then you have to kind of have like an ontology of what's meaningful. What, what should you verify? What should you talk about? What should you, what guarantees should you give? Uh, obviously, there's the crypto. And then there's a lot of discussion about the network stack and consensus. These are three low-hanging fruits. And there's already been some great work like Verdicock and so forth. So um, we're retaining a really, really super good, super specialized firm um, to come in and help IOHK as a company learn how to do this well. And um, our hope is that we can take some of those techniques and methods and come June, bring them into the Growth Indique team and start putting those methods and techniques and first into our development practices so that that client we produce will be the first formally verified Ethereum Classic client or Ethereum client in general. Second, that we can take those techniques and have them work their way into the smart contract stack which I think is much more meaningful. 
Um, the good news in that part is we're not alone. There's actually already been some great papers. Like there was an interest paper out of Chalmers University, which said, how do we use dependent typing in uh, smart contracts? And it was very well written. Um, also, Yuichi Hirai is working with the Ethereum Foundation. He's working at verifying the EVM byte code. So I, I think there's a lot of great progress that's being made and some good thought that's starting to be put into it. It's just it's kind of scattered. And our hope is over the next six months, we can unify all of it and actually figure out how to make it work well and get it into our development pipeline and then eventually build some tools that as m smart contract developers can actually do this. Um, I don't think all right. smart contracts require formal verification. Honestly, it's probably going to be library level work. So like the stuff that Zeppelin is doing or if you're going to do a DAO or something like that, that will be the standard in the community. But then your everyday smart contracts will probably use continue to use Solidity, which is a good language and there's good tooling for it. So that's what's coming, you know, like an analysis of proof of work and how can we make it more efficient and transparent and fair. Uh, the idea of overlaying trusted hardware into the network in some capacity and trying to understand what that does to the network and where we get benefit from it and if it increases democracy in the system or not. Um, a really deep analysis of decentralized funding, and then finally uh, bringing formal verification both into the client itself as well as the smart contracts that the client runs on. Um, the research is ongoing, so expect outputs on the second half of this year, and uh, our hope is to take that research from white paper into production sometime in uh, Q1 to Q2 of 2018. Yeah, so um, just kind of a overall uh, to really boil all that down to as, as simplified as I possibly can. It kind of sounds like you've got all these great puzzle pieces on the table, and now it's just a matter of putting all these awesome puzzle pieces together into something that um, can really do great things for the community. Yeah, you know, it's it's amazing because I didn't honestly think Ethereum Classic was going to survive when I first came on board. It, you know, it was uh, <laughs> it started as a protest movement, and it was just like you guys spent two years uh, very vigorously defending a particular philosophy. And then because it became inconvenient, you walked away from it. It would remind me of like, you know, I'm a Ron Paul guy. If Ron Paul woke up one day and said like, you know what, that war in Iraq was a good idea. You know, it's just, we yeah. would be like, what happened to Ron Paul? Where's the Alzheimer's? You know, what, yeah. you know, what, what, it's like bizarro land, right? You know, it's, it's like I went to the anti, he'd be having a goatee or something and it's anti spot. Yeah. So yeah. along the same lines, a lot of people felt this way. And, and at the very least, um, you know, it was a way for us to say it's not all right. It's not okay. You can't take people's money, create a social contract with them, and then violate that social contract and pretend like you didn't and expect everybody just to take it silently and feel good about it. So then when it became clear to me that the project was going to survive, then we had this terrible problem. I mean, you were in, in the beginning, so you, you saw it too, where yeah. the community was just all over the place. It was horrendously fractured. We had interesting fellows like Michael Trout and others. And it was it was a very big challenge of like, what are we really doing here? Is this just a protest or are we actually going to try to build something real? And uh, is this thing going to turn into uh, a cryptocurrency that has the right to exist? And being just a copy-paste coin does not have the right to exist. We have to have some intention to go somewhere with this community. So what really got me excited and what made me pull the trigger and commit the developers and get them in was that the community did solidify. And this was thanks to your hard work and a lot of other people's hard work. But I saw that there was a very passionate group of people who said, we want to do something cool. And, you know, Ethereum's going in a particular direction, and we're probably not going to go in that direction, and let's go try yeah, something yeah. else. I, I want to stress that, that uh, you know, I, I was definitely working on it, but there were a ton of great people um, that really helped pull pull a lot of this together. Yeah, absolutely. And and once I saw that, I said, that is so cool. You know, the other thing was that uh, it felt like the early days of Ethereum again. You know, when the early days of Ethereum was like, we didn't really have a clear roadmap. We kind of had a notion of what we wanted to do. We had a white paper, eventually a yellow paper, but God, there was a lot of like question marks and how were we actually gonna get this thing deployed? But there was this just amazing community that was so passionate and so excited. And they were all like, wow, this is gonna change the whole world. This is so cool. And that gave us the inspiration to work harder and work longer and do crazy things and eventually make those crazy things reality. Um, and so when I started interacting more with the ETC community and seeing these people, I kept getting all these messages of these people who are like exactly like the early days of Ethereum. Uh, so that was so cool. And I said, okay, that, I don't, I don't know where this is going. I don't know what's going to happen to the price. I, you know, I, a DAO hacker can do something crazy. You know, wow could do something crazy. I don't know. I don't care. 
I don't yeah. care if this cryptocurrency is worthless. We're still going to be here. We're still going to have some fun because the people here are cool. Uh, and, uh, and I like talking to them and I like hanging out with them and I could, I could go drinking with them. That's, that's really neat. Uh, and, uh, and it's amazing to see how it just kept going down and down and down and down. We found out the Ethereum foundation sold 90% of their stakes. So maybe that had something to do with it anyway, yeah. but it kept going down to 60 million. And, and, and I saw sins and some other people in the channel saying like the sky is falling. We're all going to yeah. die. And I was like, I don't care. Yeah. I, I could go to a dollar. I, you know, I would still be here. But then it went back up. And all of a sudden, the liquidity went back up, and the community got really uh, inspired. And I and I think we've reached a, a, a plateau of stability for the time being, and um, that's really encouraging to show that you can have a philosophy and a really chaotic movement, kind of work hard with it and get it structured a bit, and then have a return to normalcy, and then and all of a sudden have this great template to do some amazing things with. So um, I'm profoundly excited about the future, and I think Ethereum Classic's best days are ahead of it, and we're going to have a a lot of really cool things that come up. I think there's going to be a lot of challenges. There are going to be probably a few scams that are littered in because every cryptocurrency has that. But, yeah. you know, Mt. Gox couldn't kill Bitcoin any more than some scam can kill ETC. Uh, and we're just going to keep plugging away and chugging away for the next uh, year or two. And uh, our hope is that uh, by the time we're done and we finally hang up the towel, if we ever do, uh, we'll have left something behind that is uh, very significant and that the community will be completely self-sufficient and it'll... Uh, it won't need anybody. It's just going to do its own thing. It's like the honey badger of smart contracts. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, so anything else you'd like to uh, touch upon or let the community know? I know this is the first time you've uh, kind of addressed everybody in a little, kind of a little while here, but anything else you want to let everybody know? Oh, um, let's see. Um, I do want to apologize for all the people that have reached out to me with projects that they've wanted to work on. I've been tremendously busy with a lot of stuff and, I really do want to have like a detailed discussion about DAP development. Uh, it's just we just haven't found the time for that yet. But it is encouraging to see that organically those right. conversations are happening and, and people are doing amazing things. Second, I'd like to thank you and Christian for you know doing a great podcast and you know really just killing it with community management. I also like to thank Elaine and Carlos and uh, a whole bunch of other people uh, who, who have. Uh, uh, Lex and Cody, Cody Burns as well, and Avatar. Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All, all the, the Chinese guys, uh, Roy and everybody out in the Chinese community. Yeah, I think, I think I'm think i having sushi with Eric Gu. Uh, um, oh, nice. The 19th and, cool, uh, in cool. Japan. Um, also, I'd like to thank you for going out to Japan. That was, uh, that was uh, kind of a trial by fire. Uh, How, how's your, your Japanese you excursion have, been? You don't, you don't have to thank me for going out to Japan. <laughs> this, is, this is awesome. Yeah, pretty cool. Have you done a show yet while you, you've been in Japan, or did, were all your shows New York-based? No, no, it, it just uh, didn't line up properly as far as, like, timing was weird and, you know, getting up and stuff like that. But uh, I've got something lined up uh, for anybody listening to this right now, uh, a show for Alan McSherry, who's the lead of the Growth and Deep team. Uh, he's going to be on. Uh, I've got a show lined up for this Friday uh, okay. to have him on and talk about some of the stuff they're working on that you, you touched upon as well. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. A little bit of backstory about Alan. He's a, a very senior developer and manager. And actually, you can tell when you watch the uh, stand-up meeting. He just has a wealth of experience, a wonderful guy. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny. When we asked him to be the project manager, the first thing he did is says, well, i got to fly out and meet everybody. So uh, because we were basing the technology on Scorex and Scorex was built in Russia, he, he went to Russia. <laughs> then... Yeah, yeah. then uh, then he's planning to go to Poland, and then he's also planning to to go at some point to Argentina, and uh, we're probably going to drag him to Malta and also to a smart contract meetup in uh, Athens. And so Alan is married and everything, and he, he I don't know how his wife feels about it, but he's like living on a plane, meeting all of our people, and, and trying to make sure that the group dynamics are where they need to be and that everybody's doing the right job. But, someone, uh, uh, someone mentioned this. Who is the guy from Contact that lived on the plane? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I feel like that guy, right? Eventually, he died in the space station, though, right? <laughs> I don't know. I forgot his name. But yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He, he lived on the plane. Also, I like the way you introduced Alan earlier. You said, oh, we've got a really great Irish guy, Alan yeah. McSherry. <laughs> Alan McSherry, right. You'll yeah. love him. You've got a really great Irish guy. He's uh, always uh, he's always at the blood alcohol content legal minimum for uh, for Ireland. No, I'm just kidding. No, he actually he's he's a true professional and he's a he's a very solid engineer, a good Scala developer. And uh, what I really admire the most about him is that uh, 
he has very reasonable expectations about deadlines. I'm always like a very hard driver. Our Haskell developers will tell you that. Where I'm like, why don't we have this? Yet? Let's let's see if we can get it this week. And we just keep pushing and pushing, right? But then I try to do that with Alan, and Alan's like, no, it's gonna come out on this date. That's when we can do it. And I was like, okay, okay, all right, Alan, that's that's great. All right, you know, it's like you you just really can't you can't uh, yeah. you can't bully the guy into giving you a, like a better deadline. He's just gonna do it the way he needs to yeah. do it. There's, but that's the mark uh, of a. Uh, yeah, he's a very good manager. And, yeah, you uh, need a you need a yin and yang uh, to to coexist. To yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. You know, the other thing is that when you learn Ethereum, especially when you start dissecting the EVM, you also start learning kind of how smart contracts work at a very high level. So what's really exciting to me is like once the growth and D team is done with the growth and D client, it's not going to require seven people full time to maintain it. Occasionally, there will be like develop sprints to put in forks and things like that. But it is really cool to see what we can do with them for smart contracts. And uh, so I, I really do like when people send me DAP ideas. Um, it's just unfortunately we don't have the resources at the point to, to develop them yet. But it would be cool to start doing some DAPs on Ethereum Classic. And I think that team is going to be the, uh, the nexus of that effort on the second half of this year. Um, and uh, almost all, certainly as they understand more, they're going to have like 50 ideas of cool products that they want to do. And then we're going to have to kind of tamper them down. And that's why Alan is like the perfect guy to lead them. Because if you can say no to me, you can say no right. to them too. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, what's your experience been like? Have you ha have you enjoyed being in this uh, community management role? You know, has, uh, have you been burned too many times yet? Or you still you still got gusto and passion? No, no, you know, there's a there's a pro and con list to uh, everything in life. So there's 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 a ton ton more pros than there are cons to. So obviously, I you know been burned a couple of times, and I get some some hate mail or some hate messages every now and then. But uh, overall, everybody's really supportive all the time, and I'm you know obviously really happy to be a part of whatever you know in, in any capacity that I can be of the community and just do whatever I can for them. You know, the thing I was most proud of was how organically efficient and well executed uh, the Die Hard Fork was. It wasn't like there was some grand planning committee and there was six months of process behind it. And then there was the decider who came in and did it. They just, got, they just came together and said, this is something we need to do. And yeah, seriously. They got I, it done. And, yeah, and I, I've heard, um, I, you know, I've spoken to... Uh, Elaine a couple of times and she's she said she's like oh Splix is like a beast you know that he, right. he's, like, he's like a coding machine and so all of them just getting together and uh, you know Splix Elaine don't panic and if I'm forgetting anybody I apologize uh, it's just they've gotten so much work done just in in such a uh, an organic way like you say and also I mean snap rolls uh, 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 proposal for the for the monetary policy was completely organic as well it's right. not like he has a he has a monetary policy background but he said he's like a spreadsheet junkie and he put something together that's really awesome which is cool right you know i actually really like the proposal and um i think it's a good starting point especially when we we go into china with it and uh, i i'm very confident that something like it or it will end up surviving the trial by fire and uh, if that ends up being our final monetary policy it, it's it's not a bad deal you know, yeah. um, monetary policy is one of those things where you could potentially fight about it forever, but once it's set, it's set. And you just have to have a community consensus, this is it. We're not going to yeah. do anything more. Like Bitcoin is that way. It's like, <laughs> yes, you probably could dream up a more fair way of distributing Bitcoins, but damn it, man, it's 21 million. Accept it. Deal with it. It's, it is what it is. You know, yeah, we just have to get to that stage. Uh, from it's an like, uh, go ahead. I, I was going to say, um, I, I said this one time, it's almost like, um, the the soup Nazi from yes uh, from Seinfeld and it's like the soup is so damn good but it's like take it or leave it no soup for you so right 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 no monetary yeah. policy for you yeah. <laughs> so right so that's the monetary policy of Bitcoin and it looks like uh, ETC as well it's like the, don't ask for the bread just take the delicious soup and get out of the store that's it right <laughs> right right you know it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun though and uh, it's nice to be you know thinking about ethereum stuff again uh, that's another thing i kind of missed i didn't realize how much i missed it till i started working with the growth and deep team and, and actually thinking about the, this at a, a very deep level and i was like wow there really is a lot of magic here and i kind of got very bitter and divorced from that magic for about 2 years and so that's another thing i'm internally grateful for uh, in this this space is to have an opportunity to be able to contribute in a meaningful way 
um, and actually uh, have a community that's very receptive to it, um, you know, even if our ideas don't end up being the ones that win, that's okay because it means that probably some better ones won, uh, and uh, we all benefit from that. We're all yeah. I, I think that's that's the most important point is the the meritocracy aspect that that ET has wholeheartedly, and it's just you know people put forth proposals and ideas and different things and. Um, you know, everything is just completely merit-based, which is, I think, how you end up with a really great platform, you know. Right. Oh, I guess one last thing we should mention. So there was a lot of discussion about the picture with me and Vitalik in, uh, in Shanghai. Yeah. That was, uh, that was fun. <laughs> I, I, I guess I, I saw it a different way than not too many people had an issue with it at all. I'd say a very small percentage, but I guess I just saw it in a completely different light than the people who didn't like that picture. Right. You know, I even posted one time in the uh, Ethereum Reddit about, you know, a, a friendly competition between a chains. I, I just never saw it as such like a bloodbath, in my opinion. But, you know, everybody's entitled to well, see it. How well, I, I feel it. like I should tell people the backstory behind the picture. So so they have some content. Yeah, okay, go for yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, I um, I was in the Shanghai Winter School, and I was I flew out some of my employees as well because we have some cryptographers who work for us in Japan that came out, and we were all chatting in the hallway, and then I see Vitalik come on in. He walks right by me, and and I was like, <laughs> Wow, Vitalik's here. Okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> that's that's cool, and I hadn't talked to Vitalik in, in person since June of 2014. So it's been a little bit of time. I've you know I've chatted with him over Skype, and we've exchanged some emails and. We've had some Reddit conversations, which are known, um, and, but never in person. So, like, it's a multi-day conference, and so I expect that maybe with coffee or something, we'll run into each other again, and we didn't. And, like, a day goes by, and another day goes by, another day, and for some reason, we just never got around to talking to each other, so we have no conversation. So right before the end of the conference, Hong Sheng comes up to me, and he says, uh, Charles, would you like to be on a panel? on the conference. I wasn't a speaker. I was just attending the conference. And I said, yeah. okay, well, who's on the panel? It's, oh, it'll just be you and John Katz and a few other people. I was like, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so I go to the panel and Vitalik is sitting right there on the other side. Uh, and um, I like how he, I like how he threw in Vitalik with the few other people. Yeah, the few other people. Right. Right. That was great. As, as opposed to leaving, I was sitting yeah. next to Andrew Miller and Vitalik was on the other side with Loy Lu and a few others. And um, anyway, John immediately says, we're not going to talk about Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. <laughs> not going to get into this at all. And they just like ask privacy questions for a whole hour. And everybody <laughs> in the audience, every time they ask questions, like, it's not an Ethereum question, right? And they're like, no, no, it's not. It's like, okay. <laughs> That's funny. So at the end of the whole panel, um, I uh, I got up to leave. Vitalik started leading. And so then I said, Vitalik. And he says, ah. And <laughs> he turns around and we I walk up to him and he looks at me and I look at him. And there's like this silence that seems like it's for a whole minute. And all the cryptographers are just like frozen. Like, what are they going to say to each other? And, uh, and I go over and I hug him. <laughs> and, and I said, uh, you want to you wanna take a picture? He said, sure. So then I held up my fingers. I said, peace. And we, we got a picture. And yeah. that's, that's, the, that's the, the story behind the picture. And oh, uh, he, he went out this way. It's a, it's a better, more productive world that way, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah it is. And maybe you know, it's important maybe, to point out that yeah. None of this stuff is personal. It's like I, I got—I yeah. was in Skype like months ago, and in, in the Bitcoin Business Association channel, somebody's like, "Oh, the only reason you're an Ethereum Classic is just to get revenge on Ethereum." And I'm like, guys, it's good business. Train up a team of people that know how smart contracts work and the stack works. It doesn't cost a lot of money to train them up, and then once you have an enterprise-grade client, you can do a lot of stuff with that. We're in the business of building cryptocurrencies and eventually smart contracts, so. That's a good investment for me. The fact that I can do that for a community that's really awesome and do it on a live network and um, get that data and benefit them is just icing on the cake. Yeah. So it was a it was a rare case of where something happens and it allows you to do something that's beneficial for other people, but also good for your business. It's just like you choose some open source technology for your stack that just so happens to be useful for somebody else. You're going to make it better for everybody, and it's good for everybody. Yeah. So there's no there's nothing personal there, and and frankly, I. I think that if we do our job right, uh, we're actually going to provide a tremendous benefit to Ethereum overall, um, principally because they need, they're 100% committed to moving to proof of stake. I don't think that's going to change. And yeah. uh, there's going to be some minority of people who really just don't want to do that. And if Ethereum Classic stays on proof of uh, work, then there's a place to go where the tools are the same, the experience is the same, the, the philosophy may be somewhat compatible with what they believe. 
And so it may actually make it easier for the Ethereum Foundation to transition to uh, proof of stake. And that's going to be one of their biggest challenges because this is not just repricing gas or something. This is a massive philosophical shift on monetary policy, on the operation security of the network, and also the long-term scalability of the network. And uh, it's not something that you treat lightly. So you need a lot of people yeah. on board for that, more than just the DAO hack. So. Yep, yep. Agreed. Yeah. Well, um, mm -hmm. I mean, thanks thanks for coming on, Charles. And I'm uh, glad we got, uh, got to give the community kind of an update on what's going on behind the scenes, as well as maybe some stuff uh, uh, on the front lines that maybe they didn't know about or couldn't keep up with, you know, there's just so much going on in the community. So it's sometimes it's tough to, to keep up with all the news, you know? Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much and have some fun tomorrow uh, with uh, Alan McSherry. <laughs> all right. Take care. Cheers. Cheers.